Thanks, I really appreciate the opportunity to be here, and it's a real honor to be able to talk about one of America's longest serving politicians. And I think that says a lot in a time where a lot of us can't stand career politicians. I think there's a lot of good things we can take out of Strom Thurmond's career. And I'm not here to try to defend Strom Thurmond or apologize for him, or and I can't really convince you that he was a really decent guy or that he was necessarily right about some of the things that he stood for. But it's personal to me because I've lived in South Carolina my whole life. I went to the University of South Carolina, which has been brought up a few times. And he has a really nice fitness center named after him. If you've ever been there, it's, it's got a level of uh, volleyball courts and indoor swimming pools, uh, racquetball. There's a rock climbing wall that goes up along the whole inside of the building. There's a level with uh, really advanced weightlifting equipment, like cutting edge stuff. They got basketball courts, an indoor track. So people are in this building named after this guy and nobody really knows anything about him. They just will say like, oh, Strom Thurmond, isn't that the guy that wanted segregation and had a mixed race daughter? That's pretty much the extent of what people say. And so because I teach South Carolina history, I really wanted to pull up some positive things and give us as Southerners some things that we can take away from this career. So there's gonna be uh, three kind of distinct parts here. I'm gonna talk about Strom's overall career. I'm gonna talk about the 1948 election. And then we're gonna talk about why those things are relevant to this day. Um, and this is really relevant right now because one of his sons has even come out and he, I believe he's a state senator. And you know, he's kind of denounced the Confederate flag and not really stood up for Southern heritage. And so these are really important things that we need to talk about. And I wanted to start off by showing a short clip uh, of Strom Thurmond at 95 years old, kind of giving a brief overview of his career.
So I wanted to stop that there. But um, you could see he had some good and bad things to say about all the presidents he served under. Um, he wasn't an entirely negative person. And there's a lot of good things there that we're going to dig up today. So I wanted to start by uh, talking a little bit about Strom's family ancestry. Uh, he was born December 5th, 1902 in Edgefield, South Carolina, which is really close to the border with Georgia. And this is the same place where Francis Hugh Wardlaw is from, the guy who authored the South Carolina Ordinance of Secession. And it's where Preston Brooks is from, who uh, Kane Charles Sumner. And all three of these men are buried in the same cemetery. You can go visit it today. Um, and it's really interesting when you see the personal level that his family felt about history, because uh, on his grandfather's grave, his grandfather was named George Washington Thurman. The picture of the grave is up here. And it says uh, in his obituary, he was ever ready to respond to the demands of his country and in the dark days of Reconstruction was as ready for duty as any younger man. He was noted for his sound judgment, truthful, manly character, and many noble qualities of mind and heart. His headstone has the phrase, did not invade the rights of others nor allow others to invade his rights, which is a pretty awesome thing to have on your uh, gravestone. And allegedly, George Washington Thurman walked home from South Carolina uh, through Virginia and North Carolina after Appomattox, and he was there when Lee surrendered, according to what Strom would say. So the Southern identity and the Southern honor, that was something that was really close to Strom Thurmond early on. And you got to understand that when he was a kid, this is a time when it was still a thing to campaign to people that were real Confederate veterans that were like still alive from the Civil War or the war between the states. So he grew up going to these meetings and he would see, you know, rallies with Confederate flags and there were veterans that had lived through the war and were there. And this is what he had to say about the war between the states. I quote, for many years after the war between the states, our people were crushed and poverty stricken. Their wealth and their economy had been wiped out by a tragic war from which they sought to recover without the benefit of a Marshall Plan. In their effort to achieve prosperity, two major obstacles stood in their way. One side of tariff restrictions and discriminatory freight rates. The effect of these handicaps was to keep the South in a colonial status, producing raw materials at low cost and buying back finished products at a high cost. For many years, we have struggled under a 39% handicap in competing with northern and eastern shippers because of discriminatory freight rates. And that's exactly what Mr. Philip Lee covered the other night in his presentation. So it's really interesting connections. And the way that Strom talks about how the South was affected by the war shows that he really felt this region was punished with poverty. And he lived in a system where it was rigged to keep the South from basically prospering. But if you really want to understand a, a little bit more about him, you should dig deeper into his father's story. His father's name was John William Thurman, and he was a lawyer, a campaign manager, and a close friend of Ben Tillman. And uh, John actually had a lot of political aspirations. He was elected to solicitor, and one day his whole life changed when he was sitting in his office, and a political enemy named Will Harris uh, came into his office, and John William Thurman actually shot the man. And his story was that uh, this man Harris had come into his office and made a move like he was going for a weapon and he had called Thurmond a GD scoundrel. And if you read into it, there are actually some other reports from the scene that kind of differed from John's story a little bit. But he was found not guilty. And it's really interesting because one of the men serving on John Thurmond's defense team was Ben Tillman's nephew James who later on went to shoot a man who was the editor of the state newspaper, and that man's name was N.G. Gonzalez. So you had this kind of a bit of a violent Southern honor aspect to Strom's upbringing, and so a lot of people automatically tie Strom to that type of thinking. But I'm arguing to you that his upbringing was a little bit different. Um, he was a lot different than Ben Tillman, and he actually said one of the first life lessons he learned early on was from meeting Tillman. His dad brought him to meet him and he was waiting for Tillman to say something and Tillman said well what the heck are you waiting on are you going to shake my hand or not 
And basically, he had this rough meeting with Ben Tillman that showed him if you were going to be in politics, you had to be willing to go out and shake people's hand and really be able to identify with common people. And he actually ran against Tillman's son for state senate. So there's some ties there, but they're two totally different people that I think stood for totally different things. Um, Strom, I think, was driven by a desire of loving the South and wanting to do better than the generation before him. He grew up on a small farm and he worked in a textile mill in between school sessions. And he graduated from Clemson in 1923 with a major in agricultural science. He taught school for six years and then became county superintendent of education. And as superintendent in Edgefield, beginning in 1929, he started an adult reading program and writing program that decreased black illiteracy in the county by one fourth. He studied law at night, got elected to state senator, and then was elected as a circuit judge. And I mean, it's really exhausting when you go through and you start reading all the things he's accomplished, all the organizations he was a member of. And even after he was elected to this uh, circuit judge position, he decided he wanted to enlist in World War II. And he was really exempt from doing this. He didn't have to do this. Nobody was pressuring him to do this. But he volunteered for active duty the day war was declared. Um, he served in the 82nd Airborne Division for the invasion of Europe. He served in all the battles of the First Army, which fought through France, Belgium, Holland, Luxembourg, Czechoslovakia, and Germany. On D-Day, this man was in a glider filled with a small amount of men in a jeep. And these gliders actually had a really high casualty rating. I believe if you look into the model of the plane that he was in, like one of the first times it was actually tested in front of an audience, it crashed. And his plane did crash. Um, and all the men on his thing actually survived. They got, the, they got the jeep off of there. They met with some recon groups and he helped capture four German paratroopers on D-Day. So if you've ever seen uh, the HBO series Band of Brothers, his experience on D-Day was probably something a lot like that. And he was really particularly proud of being at the Battle of the Bulge. You can see all of his papers on Clemson and there's a really nice invitation that he extended to all South Carolina veterans of the Battle of the Bulge who he offered to fly out uh, over to Europe to see the raising of a monument there for that battle. So when Strom returned to South Carolina, he got back on the circuit bench and he wasn't a terrific judge. He wasn't like an amazing judge or anything, but he goes on and he was elected governor in 1946 over 10 other opponents. And just weeks after his inauguration, there was a lynching of a black man named Willie Earl. And Strom Thurmond actually stood out in the headlines at this time because he was working closely with the law enforcement to resolve the case and apprehend all the suspects. And this is what he said about this case. He said that it was not only regrettable, but a blot on the state of South Carolina. And he called lynching an offense against decency, law, and the democratic way of living. And around this time, he also started building an alliance with other groups like military organizations, like VFW, uh, Winthrop University, uh, Bob Jones, uh, Evangelicals, the Baptist Church, Red Cross. He started building a network of people that, you know, kind of aligned with a lot of the things that he felt in were going on in South Carolina at the time. And about the same time, he began growing suspicious of Harry Truman and the goals of the Democratic Party. As you saw in the video, he said that he believed Harry Truman's goal was to bring the power back to Washington and to the executive. And at the Democratic Convention that year in Philadelphia, the party fractured over a number of issues. Truman was pushing a platform aimed at civil rights and proposed the end to the poll tax, a federal law against lynching, and a permanent Fair Employment Practices Commission known as the FEPC. So the state's rights Democrats, which everybody refers to as the Dem uh, Dixiecrats, they formed after a faction of Southerners left this Democrat convention, and they felt that Truman had betrayed the South. And Strom's actual words were that he felt Southerners were being treated as a doormat on which uh, presidential candidates could wipe their shoes. And this message was finding reception all around the country. There was actually a popular conspiracy theory at the time 
that was emerging saying that the Dixiecrats were formed by big oil money because in 1947, a Supreme Court case left the issue of Tidelands wide open after a dispute between federal government and California. California had been leasing oil concessions to private contractors on land that had immense gas and oil deposits, and this was land that the government wanted access to. And there was a journalist named Thomas Sancton who stated the party was formed by investing and managing communities that consisted of the oil and cattlemen of Texas, the oil men and sugar planters of Louisiana, the mercantile and shipping interests of New Orleans, Houston, Memphis, and Atlanta, the steel and coal operators of Alabama, the textile manufacturers of the whole South Atlantic region. So that was what a lot of the popular theory was, but Strom Thurmond declared outright, he said, if there is that money there, a dime of it never went through my hands. That was his words exactly. And, um, you know, a lot of people looked at it like if you see this picture here, they're portraying the Democrat Party as this donkey and nobody can really handle it and plow the ground straight. Um, so that was kind of, you know, another popular idea that just, hey, the Democrat Party is not really identifying with some of these hardworking people that make it up, which is an argument they're making right now. Uh, but this, the state's writers, they never saw themselves as just a regional party. Strom Thurmond actually said that he thought they had a lot of national interests and they were actually trying to prevent something like a secession. But the media did a really effective job of keeping them regional in appearance. The, the name Dixie Kratz actually came from an editor, which uh, I'll mention here in a bit. But um, if you just want to know how bad was the media perception and how bad were the hit pieces on the Dixie Kratz, you could pick up this Time magazine where they covered Strom Thurmond in their October 11th, 1948 issue. So this would have been... I guess about a month before the election. And they really like make fun of the way he talks. They say, oh, instead of saying force, he says fos. And instead of saying school, he says school. And then they talk about Ben Tillman. They really just make Strom Thurmond seem like a quirky guy and they don't talk about really any of the issues. And you could find this magazine very cheaply. I, I found it on eBay for like 10 bucks. Um, and you can see that this is what they were trying to portray this party as. So the party ended up collecting over a million votes and they went on to win the states of South Carolina, Alabama, Mississippi, and Louisiana. And some people felt that along the way, you know, Strom Thurmond had started off as this young progressive. He was outspoken about lynching. He actually tried to do away with the poll tax in South Carolina. And he was getting a lot of progressive opinions uh, in, in his favor. But then people started to only identify him with this race issue. So after 1948, he started going out trying to repair his image within the black communities of South Carolina. He pardoned a black man that was facing an unfair manslaughter conviction and led a campaign to raise funds for Benedict College, which is a historically black college that fell on hard times. He declared April 5th Booker T. Washington Day and he gave a strong speech to the American Legion, declaring his intolerance for the KKK or any other organization that targeted black people. A stir was also caused when he appointed a black Charleston doctor to the state hospital board, which was the first time since Reconstruction that a black man was given a public position in South Carolina. Now, South Carolina also had a law which forbid governors at the time from serving more than one consecutive term. So Strom ran for the Senate in 1950 and lost, and he just spent some time practicing law. Uh, he opened up a federal savings bank and loan association in Aiken. And during this uh, period, his firm worked on everything from murders to divorce, and he personally helped the Atomic Energy Commission buy cheap private land near the Savannah River nuclear plant. Strom also basically for all purposes abandoned the Democrat Party at this time and he started supporting Eisenhower. And it was practically an act of political suicide in South Carolina at that moment. And by 1954, he decided it was time to get back into politics. Um, because he had supported Eisenhower in 52, the South Carolina Democratic Party blocked him from being nominated and he ran as a write-in candidate. 
He won and became the first ever person elected to the Senate by a write-in ballot, the first ever person to the Senate. And this launched a career that lasted until he retired in 2003. So in 1960, Strom again voted Republican, but this time for Richard Nixon. And he actually compared this move to the days of Reconstruction when a lot of Southerners were trying to get people to back Rutherford B. Hayes to put an end to Reconstruction. His actual argument was that uh, Thurman and the new Democratic South needed to back Nixon so that they could put an end to the new Reconstruction that was being pushed by Lyndon Johnson and Kennedy. And Strom, he, he was a person that didn't shy away from like conspiracy theories. He actually believed that Kennedy was very soft on communism, like you heard. He claimed that Kennedy had ties to the mafia. And he had a lot of opposition with the Democratic Party that boiled over into some events in the Senate. Like on one occasion, he wrestled a senator named Rolf, uh, Ralph Yarborough from Texas outside the Senate chamber in 1964. And apparently this was a situation where Strom was kind of bitter about something they were voting on. He wasn't going to go and vote on it. And the guy came up and kind of nudged him like, come on, let's, let's just go to this quorum. And Strom said, whoa, don't be touching me. And these guys kind of, they, they took all the change out of their pockets and they started to wrestle. And Strom took this guy down and stayed on him until they separated the guys. So by 1964, He's done with the Democrats, and he came out supporting Barry Goldwater. And his qualms with the Democrats were that they backed down from invading Cuba during the uh, Russian Missile Crisis. He argued that they were plunging America into unwinnable Vietnam conditions, and that they were turning America into a welfare state. And this was in part a, a calculated move to really change his image and move his career in another direction. And it became a point where race was no longer an issue that Strom Thurmond would campaign on. Instead, he talked about foreign policy, threats of communism. He denounced Vietnam, attacked inflation, and he generally spoke in support of elderly people, people on fixed incomes, and just ordinary black and white people from the South. Just a couple of years before he switched parties, he had been building his reputation as a conservative by working with other senators to propose an amendment permitting prayer and Bible reading in schools. This came after a Supreme Court case called Engel versus Vitale, which said reading public prayer in schools violated the First Amendment, which that was the issue that he was absolutely right on, because nowhere does the Constitution actually forbid talking about God in public places or really separating church and state. Probably the most important turn in his career was when Strom helped Nixon and the Republicans carry South Carolina in 1968. Nixon was facing a tough third party candidate in George Wallace, who was claiming segregation now and segregation forever. And Wallace ended up carrying Georgia, Alabama, Mississippi, Arkansas, and Louisiana that year. South Carolina, with the exception of Jimmy Carter in 76, has been a solid red state ever since this time. And Richard Nixon actually mentioned Strom in his autobiography, and he pointed out that, you know, where a lot of people saw this guy who was just a segregationist, Richard Nixon saw a strategic statesman that really had a finger on the pulse of the people in his state and really could play the political game very well. So now I want to go back and talk about the election of 1948 a little bit, because this is a key moment. A lot of people assume that Strom was one of the guys that even walked out of the 1948 Democratic Convention and that he did it all about race. Well, if you really study it, he, did, he wasn't one of the guys that actually left. The uh, delegates that left were mostly from Mississippi and Alabama. And he actually supported uh, Richard Russell for president. So he wasn't one of the original people that left, and the name Dixiecrats came from a writer named Bill Wisner, and he was the telegraph editor of the Charlotte News. Uh, so Strom Thurmond was actually nominated to lead this party because he had a progressive image up to that time, not because he was some race baiter that was just foaming at the mouth for segregation. The assumption that the states' rights Democrats 
formed only for racist reasons is not looking at the whole picture. It's not based on the truth. And if you want to find the most unbiased source you could to really prove this, I would suggest looking at H.L. Mencken. H.L. Mencken covered the 1948 election, and he's probably the least partisan guy that was covering this. He covered all the conventions. And H.L. Mencken actually mentioned that he hoped the politicians running would be led out to a pasture and shot. <laughs> um, he predicted a Truman victory because he said voters are boobs who distrust real intelligence and throw their caps for the candidate most closely approximating their collective IQs. <laughs> so he basically said, Truman's going to win because people are dumb. <laughs> like, voters are dumb. That's literally what he said. And then he, he described Strom Thurmond at this Democratic convention, and everything he said was pretty positive. He said, this guy's a soldier. He's a gentleman. Um, he said Strom's tone was soft with no hint of demagoguery. Okay? And even though Mencken was critical of a lot about the South, I mean, he wrote a lot of negative things about the Scopes trial, um, the Leo Frank lynching, the New Deal, because Southerners tended to support the New Deal a lot. He, he'd love to bash on the South, but he was even more opposed to massive growth of federal power. And he argued that the Dixiecrats deserved more attention. He said that the movement wasn't just a regional one, and he stated that many intelligent Southerners were, quote, painfully aware of what went on in the 70s, and they are naturally fearful of a repetition with northern job holders, most of them dishonest and nearly all of them jackasses, substituted for the carpetbaggers of the first canto. They believe they have some civil rights, too. So this is his words he's writing, saying, you know, these guys have a serious proposition that you should look into if you're a guy like me that doesn't like totalitarian government. Minkin actually said that he would have voted for the Dixiecrats if they had been included on the Maryland ballot. And when discussing their Southern supporters, he wrote, I must confess that I sympathize with them despite my lifelong devotion to exposing their deficiencies. So he's even taking a jab at the South while he's saying that they're right about the, the uh, state's rights Democrats. Here was a man who had no love for the South, and he was committed to real journalism, trying to show that the state's rights Democrats had a serious proposition. A closer, unbiased examination shows that race wasn't really the biggest issue with the Dixiecrats. Rather, as Mencken noted, they were taking a stand against government that had been rapidly expanding its own powers up to that time. Strom himself lived through two world wars, he put his life on the line to fight fascism, and he thought that the growing threat of communism was something that needed to be brought up and addressed frequently. He was trying to basically sound an alarm for Americans that it could happen here. In fact, the progressive candidate that was running in 1948 was Henry Wallace, who was an avowed communist. He wrote about it and self-professed many times that he was a communist, and interestingly, somebody brought up stuff about masonry. I think if you look into the election of 1948, uh, Dewey, Wallace, Truman, and Strom are all Freemasons. If you look into that, I, I don't think that that means anything. It's a big organization, but they all knew each other and they're all members of a club that not all of us are a part of. So the civil rights proposals in 1948 were a big reason that he was standing up, but these civil rights proposals weren't just things to do with race. They were things that had language in the laws that really drastically increased the powers of government, very similar to how Hitler and Stalin and Mao and all these people started off their movements. And if you look at everything happening around the election of 1948, there's some serious things that happened in this time. Truman created the CIA and the NSA. Uh, Mao Zedong came to power in 1947, and Israel's was created in 1948. And these are all key things that have a lot to do with America's destiny. And Strom Thurmond is just voicing his opinion that, hey, we need to take a stand right now to make sure that we're not going down the same path some of these European governments just did. So he wasn't wrong for venting his concern, in my opinion. And if you look at the points that he made about the Democrat Party platform, it's, you'd have a really hard time proving what he's saying wrong. Like if you talk about the poll tax, for example, 
a lot of people say, oh, well, the poll tax was just a racist way for southern states to keep people from voting. But if you dig deeper, you'll see that California, Connecticut, Maine, Massachusetts, Minnesota, New Hampshire, Ohio, Pennsylvania, Vermont, and Wisconsin all had poll taxes at one time or another, and it functioned as a form of revenue for the state. In 1948, only seven states even had the poll tax, and Strom was in favor of repealing it in South Carolina, but he's opposing it because he doesn't want the government to get involved in the poll tax. And his actual wording was that it would let them exercise control over the ballot boxes of the nation, and that the states would lose their effective voice in that national legislative halls as they did in Reconstruction days when ballot boxes were surrounded by federal bayonets. And then there was a topic of lynching. Strom personally, he had already gone on the record condemning lynching, saying that he was against this, right? But the reason he was against a federal law regarding lynching was that he said, look, this has never been necessarily a Southern action. And he pointed out that at, that at least one year, 75% of the people lynched across the United States were white. And it wasn't really something that was going on a lot. He thought that these were matters that needed to be handled locally, not under the umbrella of government authority. And then he was he railed on the FEPC a lot, which threatened to drastically change hiring processes for employers. And under these guidelines, if you were an employer, you lose the ability to hire and fire whoever you please. And the bill was first proposed by a Republican senator named Irving Ives from New York. And it was literally modeled after a law created by Stalin called the All Races Law. And this is something Strom Thurmond talked about many times in the record. Um, he said that Stalin was commissar of nationalities at that time that he wrote this law, and he used it as a means of advancing himself to supreme dictator of Soviet Russia. The proposed American program would forbid you to ask someone basic questions about their race, religion, skin color, or even where they were during World War I. Strom pointed out that Thomas Dewey, the Republican candidate for president in 48, and the governor of New York, was one of the biggest supporters of the FEPC. And previously, this guy Dewey was one of the ones that was fighting the efforts of Southern governors to equalize the freight rates. So he's saying, look, the same guy that wants to regulate everything you do with your business is the same guy that is ripping us off with freight. Is this really what you want to go with? This is the type of argument that he is making. And then finally, uh, we need to address the segregation issue because it's one of the things that people only really use their emotions when they talk about. And it's something we need to, it's a big part of American history that we need to just go ahead and get over feeling rough about and just come up with ways to make it right and talk about people, uh, talk about it in a real way. Strom had been outspoken about his support for segregation and because the Dixiecrats had a plank in their platform dedicated to it, the automatic assumption is that this was the only reason the Dixiecrats were created. But was it for racist reasons? The plank actually said that they stood for segregation, quote, and the integrity of the races. Strom himself said many times that he thought thinking Southerners were well aware that you need good race relations if you want to have a prosperous South. And in a pamphlet about Truman's civil rights program, he said, a little more practical help along economic lines and a little less fallacious racial theory would accomplish a great deal more for the improvement of the, the level of life and opportunity for all our people, whatever their race. So he's basically saying, look, I know the South has problems with race. Nobody is denying that, but there are better ways to address this issue. That was his argument. We need help along economic lines. We're poor, we're getting ripped off. We need to discuss all the options here. And the truth, which has been really left out, and I, I was, honestly, I'm surprised that nobody brought this up before me, but when I dig and look through history, the first segregation laws that I found were actually coming from the North, and they were imposed on the South during Reconstruction. The case that I found in particular was called Roberts versus the city of Boston in Massachusetts. 
And this was an 1849 case where the General School Committee of Boston said that the city of Boston had power under the Constitution and laws of this commonwealth to make provisions for the instruction of colored children in separate schools established exclusively for them and to prohibit their attendance upon other schools. So the first segregation law did come out of Boston. And if you want to know how bad it was when Strom Thurmond was running, you need to check out this book called Death at an Early Age. It's by a teacher named Jonathan Cazole, and he worked in the public schools in Boston, and he wrote about the nightmare that he experienced there. Um, he basically said that, you know, the reason he's calling it death at an early age is that there were such low expectations and the students in these schools were treated so poorly that they were basically condemning them to a life of failure. And, you know, you don't see these things necessarily going on in the South. I mean, you, you see stuff about facilities, like the facilities were definitely not equal. That's something we need to talk about. But you don't see cases where people are mistreated to that level that this gentleman wrote about. And there's just mountains of evidence if you really want to get into the discrimination and the violence black people experienced in the North that it was worse in, than it was in the South in some places. And it's not even just Boston. Take New York. In an area called the Stuyvesant, uh, uh, in the area called Stuyvesant, there was a town development built near New York City, and it was a $50 million post-war housing project that covered nearly 20 blocks. The Metropolitan Life Insurance Company insisted the mortgage carry a cause in the contract forbidding any black tenants into the apartments. And in addition, you could go back and find a newspaper called The Evening Star, which was a DC publication. And this had an article, February 25th, 1957, that had an expert on human relations say that Chicago was the most segregated city in America. And it just seems odd to me that all these things are going on in the North, but the only thing you really hear or see is Little Rock, Arkansas in 1954. That's all you see, and nobody wants to talk about the full picture. And that's what I think a lot of people are missing from when we look at Strom's career is he was really trying to stand up for where he was from, not just say he was better or he was right, but hey, we're doing okay. And one of the best descriptions that I've found of this hypocrisy, which we look at history, comes from a man named Davis Lee. Davis Lee, I've had trouble finding exactly all the details of his life, but he was a black publisher from New Jersey. And I believe he worked on a paper called The Baltimore Afro-American. And he wrote about uh, all the experiences with segregation and stuff, and he had an editorial that reached half a million black readers. And he decided one day he was going to visit the South and see if the stories about segregation were true that he had heard. And this is what he wrote, and this is a lengthy quote, and you can actually find this um, from some of the literature that the states' rights Democrats put out at their convention. And this is a long quote, so, I am certainly in a better position to voice an opinion than the Negro leader who occupies a suite in downtown New York and bases his opinions on the South from the distorted stories he reads in the Negro press and in the Daily Worker. The racial lines in the South are so clearly drawn and defined, there can be no confusion. When I am in Virginia or South Carolina, I don't wonder if I will be served if I walk into a white restaurant. I know the score. However, I have walked into several right here in New Jersey where we have civil rights laws and I've been refused service. All the Negro businesses in New Jersey will not amount to as much as our race has in one city in Georgia. And he was talking about Atlanta. He said this is also true in South Carolina and Virginia. New Jersey employs one Negro in the motor vehicle department. All of the states above mentioned employ plenty. No matter what a Negro wants to do, he can do it in the South. In Spartanburg, South Carolina, Ernest Collins, a young Negro, operates a large funeral home, a taxi cab business, a filling station, grocery store, has several buses, runs a large farm and a nightclub. 
Mr. Collins couldn't do all of that in New Jersey or New York. The only bus line operated by Negroes is in the South. The Safe Bus Company in Winston-Salem, North Carolina, owns and operates over 100. If a Negro in New Jersey or New York had the money and attempted to obtain a franchise to operate a line, he would not only be turned down, but he would be lucky if he did not get a bullet in the back. The entire race program in America is wrong. We expend all our energies and spend millions of dollars trying to convince white people that we are as good as they are, that we are an equal. Joe Lewis is not looked down upon as a Negro, but as the greatest fighter of all time, loved and admired by whites in South Carolina as much by those in Michigan. He convinced the world not by propaganda and agitation, but by demonstration. And that was the quote from... Um, Davis Lee. And that's a pretty powerful quote. I was really glad I found that. But you don't even have to just listen to those sources. Uh, there's a lot more that you can look into. If you keep digging, you'll find more. Um, Strom was even proud that he helped save Meharry Medical College in Nashville, Tennessee, which is one of only two black medical colleges in the country. And he noted that the Southern governors were happy that they were able to do this because the people who were crying progressivism weren't even trying to help the black colleges. So why do we look back at this time and we don't look at people like Marcus Garvey and Booker T. Washington who promoted self-help and condemn these guys? They were black leaders that were all about helping their own, promoting their own way of life, and you know, living it amongst each other peacefully. They weren't going around shaming white people for segregation. So we need to really take example from all sides. We shouldn't just feel bad about it from our perspective. There were other people that, from all sides that had ideas just like Strom Thurmond's. And Davis Lee, the publisher from New Jersey mentioned previously knew this. And that's why he stated, quote, our fight for recognition, justice, civil rights and equality should be carried on within the race. Let us demonstrate to the world by our living standards, our conduct, our ability and intelligence that we are the equal of any man. And we, when we shall, when we, we, uh, and when we shall have done this, the entire world, including the South, will accept us on our terms. Our present program of threats and agitation makes enemies out of our friends. So Strom Thurmond, yeah, he might have supported segregation. Okay, but he wasn't going around saying that he was better than anybody or superior to anybody. Nothing like that. And in fact, you could argue that his whole opposition to eliminating segregation had more to do with centralization of government than anything else. Part of the Democratic Party platform in 1948 was not only to get rid of segregation, but to create new federal police that were basically meant to sp spy on businesses and make sure people conform and break down freedoms of association. And this is why the Democrat Party had a, the state's rights Democrat Party had a plank that stated, quote, we oppose the usurpation of legislative functions by the executive and judicial departments. We unreservedly unres condemn the effort to establish in the United States a police nation that would destroy the last vestige of liberty enjoyed by a citizen. And we oppose the totalitarian, centralized, bureaucratic government and the police nation called for by the platforms adopted by the Democratic and Republican conventions. So twice, Strom Thurmond mentions police nation. And he worries that that is where we're headed. And I hear people saying that today all the time. Anytime there is a shooting, anytime anything happens, the media capitalizes on it and says that, we're a police nation and things are terrible. So I think in that regard, he was certainly right. So I wanna wrap up and talk about how we can interpret all this about Strom Thurmond and how we should feel about it from the Southern perspective. And an interesting way to think about this is by looking at a couple of other people that have said things about him. In 2002, Strom Thurmond turned 100 years old and a former Senator named Trent Lott came under fire because he said this about South Carolina history. 
He said, when Strom Thurmond ran for president, we voted for him. We're proud of it. And the rest of the, if the rest of the country had followed our lead, we wouldn't have had all these problems over all these years either. And after Trent Lott made that statement, uh, his career basically became ruined. He was forced to resign. And media outlets just talked about this guy supporting the old segregation candidate from 1948. And it's interesting because if you go back, another man from Massachusetts said the same thing about Strom Thurmond in 1963. There was a man named Gregory D. Shorey, and he moved from Massachusetts to South Carolina to start up a company. And this is what he said about Strom Thurmond. He called Strom one of the greatest statesmen of our time, and he said that many of us had prayerfully hoped he might have made it in 1948. If this happy event had occurred, this country would be measurably better off today, and we would have safeguarded many of the freedoms and individual liberties being taken from us by executive order today. So the point I'm saying is not that Lot or Shorey were right for defending Strom. I'm saying that, hey, some people did feel this way, and it's valid to want to understand why people would feel that way and explore that a little bit. You shouldn't have to feel bad about that. If you look at what happened in the election of 1948, the states' rights Democrats only won four states. And while they might have not had immense success, the national attention gained by them helped launch Strom's career in the Senate. And over the years, many people have looked at the Dixiecrat movement and come to the conclusion that there's really nothing but negative things to take away from this. And they've said, well, yeah, Strom Thurmond talked about communism, but he was really just saying the new dog whistle for racists. That was just the key word. And I've actually read these things in real histories about him. And if you want to make that, you know, his movement all about race, that's your right. But he had good arguments, and he was truly trying to steer us away from totalitarian governments, in my opinion. And you just look at what Truman did. Look at what Truman did when he was elected. Okay, he went on to violate the Constitution in several ways that have had long-lasting implications. In 1950, after North Korea invaded the South, Truman intervened with the American troops in a United Nations police action. There was never any congressional declaration of war or consultation with Congress, and sources show that over 36,000 American soldiers died in the Korean War, and there were also a lot of guys that were captured and exposed to things like brainwashing, and they were captured there for a long time. Truman, and we're still involved in Korea as well, obviously. Truman also tried to seize and operate many American steel mills to aid wartime production in the name of emergency powers, which we're seeing right now. And according to Article 1, Section 8 of the Constitution, it's the duty of Congress to declare war and raise support for armies. And it says that no appropriation of money to be, is to be used for that for a term longer than two years. So this flagrant abuse of power by Truman has given every other president after him basically the ability to just invade wherever they want. We've had military operations in Vietnam, Iraq, Afghanistan, Pakistan, Yemen, Somalia, Libya, Uganda, and Syria. And... I support the president, but you can't even say that Donald Trump has really tried to stop this. He vetoed a bill that would have taken U.S. troops out of Yemen. He wrote an executive order that would basically allow the government to blow up anybody they want with drones, and they don't have to release any information about it. So he's talked a lot about the military-industrial complex and things, but he hasn't done enough, in my opinion, to, to really expose it and do away with it like he promised. And the election of 1948 also marked a key turning point in U.S. history, a point where the U.N. Charter superseded our Constitution. Not even two years after 1948, uh, the 1948 election, Harry Truman authored a document, and it's called Our Foreign Policy. It's a Department of State publication, number 3972, and it's in the General Foreign Policy Series 26, and it was released in 1950 from the Office of Public Affairs. And in this document, Truman refers to the U.S. strictly as part of an international community, not as a sovereign nation, as an international community. 
And he explains that this means that we need to organize members to deal collectively with their problems, collectively with their problems, and to defend themselves collectively against anyone who may threaten the peace and tranquility of the community. Truman also said that this community, quote, may in time lead to the international control of all armament, which is essential. It may eventually lead to a form of world government, which is a possibility that excites the imagination of some adventurous people. Finally, Truman sprinkled this document with democracy many times over and indicated that we want the kind of international community in which each nation is free to manage its own affairs subject, of course, to its pledges and responsibilities under the UN Charter. So he flat out says, we're part of international community now. We're subject to the UN Charter. We're working on things collectively. That's allowing the needs of other nations, in my opinion, to come before Americans. And it's allowing the UN Charter to come before the Constitution. So Strom, I mean, he called it on all these things. If you look back, he was extremely critical of how the Korean War was handled. He said that the Secretary of State at that time, his name was Dean Acheson, gave a major speech in 1950 where he didn't even mention Korea at all as one of our interests. Strom supported prohibiting trade with China until the communists released every prisoner of the UN and a peace treaty was signed. There's also some evidence, I think, to suggest that if Strom was elected in 1948, MacArthur probably wouldn't have been fired for milit uh, he wouldn't have been fired for insubordination during the thick of the Korean War. Uh, Thurman didn't agree with muzzling the military, as you heard in the video, and he didn't agree with appeasement. And many years later, in 1962, he was the only senator to call for an unequivocal invasion of Cuba after the Soviets put missiles there. So basically, today, I mean, my whole lifetime, I don't know any other way. The United States has been the police force around the world. And now that we've declared war on a tactic like terrorism, you know, we're basically allowed ourselves to be in a situation where we can fight anywhere all the time in the name of terrorism. I mean, there's people in this room right now, guaranteed, don't know where we have soldiers on the ground. And you can't account for them all and where we're fighting exactly. Nobody knows. Strong, uh, you could see Trump, Donald Trump in front of the White House. He walks out. They say, Mr. President, are we going to war with Iran? Donald Trump says, hope not. I mean, I thought it was up to you. I guess not. Strom wasn't the most anti-war guy, but he's critical of how a lot of these conflicts were handled. And he was on the record in 1975 in the Oval Office advising Gerald Ford that there was probably still a way we could help South Vietnam be independent and save our reputation in South Asia. Strom believed that an adequate defense of our coasts wasn't enough in a post-World War II world. And just like many antebellum Southerners saw their world as one of the last true vestiges of Western Civ, Strom viewed the United States as the last bulwark against communism. And he was against military intervention unless it was something we could fully commit to. So we've really become a global power. You look at things like the Patriot Act, um, Americans' privacy has been completely compromised, just like Strom said. We've become a police state. And if you look at what Edward Snowden said, this man leaked information from the government, allegedly, saying that, among other things, the NSA has 80 listening stations around the globe. I think he even detailed that they had things like Angela Merkel's cell phone on a wiretap, and they could just listen into anything anytime they want. It's become the exact police nation that Strom Thurmond predicted, but now it's on a global scale. And we need to go back and address a couple things about the race issue from 1948, because can we really look around America today and say that that process provided any healing? There's more hate and vitriol in the air right now than there's ever been in my lifetime and than I'm sure many people have seen in decades. You can feel our society fracturing every day along these different lines and you can't go out and have a conversation with people without someone getting triggered or feeling like they're being microaggressed and this is happening all over you can't have 
discussions on college campuses, out in the park, anything. The, U, the public school system, ha, it's been documented that it's more segregated today than it was in the mid 1900s. In 2016, the US Government Accountability Office investigators completed a study showing that from 2000 to 2014, the percentage of public high schools in poverty and the percentage of schools that are mostly black or Hispanic more than doubled. The percentage of all schools with so-called race or socioeconomic isolation grew from nine to 15%. An isolated school is one that has 75% or more students that are of the same race or class. Investigators found that these schools offered fewer classes, had higher rates of discipline issues, and the report also detailed that Hispanic students are triple segregated. They said they were triple segregated by race, economics, and language. All of this is interesting when you go back and remember that Strom Thurmond stood for the integrity of the races. And now you have the left has totally hijacked anything to do with race. The UCLA has even come out and said that the popular phrase, some of you might have heard it, they say, there's only one race, the human race. Well, UCLA has come out and said that that statement is racist. So, I mean, everything that we're seeing about race is totally being redefined. And it's not fair that people just want to throw Strom Thurmond in the fire and just forget about it. Perhaps one of the best things that we could do is look at some of the other people that supported Strom Thurmond when he was running for office. Murray Rothbard is a good example. He's one of the founders of modern libertarianism. And he was a New Yorker who wrote a pretty detailed letter to Thurmond and he described himself as a staunch supporter of the Thurman movement. And he said that as an economist, he enthusiastically supported the Dixiecrat proposals on national debt and taxes. He also said that their platform was one of the best in American history and one of the finest political statements since Calhoun's exposition. <coughs> Rothbard went on to lament that we were living under a one-party socialist system in reality. And he said that National Socialism has always meant poverty, tyranny, and war. His big critique of the Dixiecrats was that he thought they were too focused on purely Southern interests. But if you go back, he calls the Civil Rights Program the Civil Tyranny Program. And Rothbard asks Thurman in the letter, what about the myriad invasions of states' rights in other fields by the power-hungry Washington bureaucracy? Rothbard believed that the states' rights movement needed to establish itself nationally to defend against socialist programs that he claimed would go through and destroy this land of liberty. Today, we have people openly flirting with socialism. They're saying, hey, I got a Green New Deal. Hey, the world's going to end in 12 years if we don't do climate change right now. Socialism is the only way to fix it. And these things are, you know, young kids are really buying into this and accepting this and it's becoming an issue, just like these guys talked about. And these basic core principles at the center of American thought today, like decentralization, free markets, low taxes, they were supported by people like Thurman and Rothbard, only to be remolded again into movements we're seeing right now, like the Tea Party and the Convention of States. And I'm pretty much completely against the Convention of the States, but you should read the literature that they put out. They're saying all the time, oh, the states are the only way we can save America. Well, you know, Strom Thurmond was saying that over half a century ago, you know, so you're going to have to do more than that to impress me for the Convention of States. And there were a lot of really creative people that weren't really involved in politics that saw really good things in Strom, like Robert Frost, for example. He signed a book, and I have the picture of the note that he left up here, uh, for the Thurman family, but he said to Jean and Strom Thurman with wonder and admiration from a Vermont States writer. And a lot of people don't know that Robert Frost was actually born Robert Lee Frost. And his father, William, was from Massachusetts, but he sympathized with the South during the war between the states. He tried to join the Confederacy, was captured in Philadelphia, and he fled to San Francisco, where he became a Copperhead journalist. So many people don't even know that Robert Frost had that experience and he spent a lot of his time in agrarian pursuits. 
and writing agrarian poetry. And another pretty odd example, I think, is someone you'd least suspect, James Brown. He was described as the godfather of soul music. And he's, yeah, I mean, he said, you know, say it loud, I'm black and I'm proud. Those were things that he sang about. He was very all about the self-help movement. And he actually said this about Strom Thurmond in a 1999 Rolling Stone interview. This is what James Brown said. He said, Senator Thurmond has been able to stay afloat all these years, and he's great for our country. When the young whippersnappers get out of line, whether Democrat or Republican, an old man can walk up and say, wait a minute, son, it goes this way, and that's great for our country. He's like a grandfather to me. And you can actually uh, see online, there's a video on C-SPAN where James Brown actually performed a little concert for Strom Thurmond's 90th birthday, and he sang happy birthday to him and stuff. And one of Strom Thurmond's sons actually served as James Brown's attorney. So this powerful symbol could accept Strom. Um, this powerful symbol of black pride could accept Strom. But, you know, you can't even have an honest conversation about the guy today. And one of the last things that I think we need to talk about is one of the most controversial things to do about his life is his mixed race daughter. And she was actually his first child. Strom didn't get married until he was 44 years old. And this girl, um, her name was Essie Mae Washington Williams. And he actually met her mother when he had just gotten out of college in 1925. He was teaching agriculture classes and coaching football at Edgefield High School. And her mother was basically like a maid for the family. And she actually had nice things to say about the Thurman family. And you can read in his daughter's book, don't take my word for it, read, read her book. She says that um, her mom would say really nice things about Strom. Like, for example, she said he knew everything about fruits and vegetables and that he would go out to the orchards and pick peaches and he'd know exactly when they were ripe and which ones would be the sweetest. She said that at the time, Strom was known for having an eye for the ladies and he was handsome. He would always be running in the road half naked at the crack of dawn because that was part of his health routine and she couldn't help but notice. There was clearly a connection there. In fact, the very first time she met Strom Thurmond, she was about 16, about finished with high school. Her mom took her to see him in his, in his political office and she said clearly that she thought her mom and him were in love and this is before he's married. So this is what his daughter is saying, like she's getting vibes, like these two kind of love each other. And she also noted that Strom had this like bone crushing killer handshake and he loved South Carolina history and was just real passionate about the history of his state. So over the years, they actually met in secret many times. He always provided large sums of money for her every time that they met. He fully paid for her college education at um, South Carolina State University in Orangeburg and people knew about this I mean it was rumored for many years that he had a black daughter or that there was black members of the Thurman family and it was circulated but it didn't really f come out fully until after he had passed and it was interesting experience for her because here she is in college her dad has just been elected governor and she can't tell anybody about it so that was really interesting. And she actually said, like, man, I wish he would come more. I wish I got more letters from him. And she, her feelings were actually hurt when he ran as a Dixiecrat and some of the things that he said about race. And her words were that the image of South Carolina as progressive was sacrificed at the altar of her father's political ambitions. And after the election passed, the two had a meeting where she made it clear that segregation just made her feel uncomfortable and bothered her. And she stated that black people in South Carolina couldn't even go to Edisto Gardens, which was located near Orangeburg and is still famed today for its roses, azaleas, and cypress trees that are hundreds of years old. So this is Strom's logic. This is him explaining to her where he's coming from. And I want you to really listen because this is his words and, you know, it's her perspective. So maybe it's been changed a little bit. But he said, Essie Mae, Edisto is private property. The owners can do what they want. Private property is the essence of the American democracy. I know you're an A student in history. I shouldn't have to tell you that. Would you want the government telling you what to do with your property? He then went on an assault 
against Truman and how he believed Truman's civil rights program was a Stalin-esque tactic to tell people how to run their businesses, make sure black people were put in jobs, whether or not they were qualified, and then send spies to ensure conformity. So he believed he was doing the right thing in this, and he went on to say, I never expected to win. I never expected to run. It was quite an experience, quite an honor. I was trying to make a point for the South that the South has to be respected, that there can't be another reconstruction, that the federal will can't be imposed. I wasn't against Negroes. I was against Washington. Maybe I spoke too strongly. Maybe I got too passionate. If I did, then I'm sorry. Washington was simply using the Negro as a wedge. I guarantee I care more about the Negro than Harry Truman. Just look at my record. Study John C. Calhoun, as he may, our greatest South Carolinian. You'll understand exactly what this campaign was about. So perhaps if you look at it in these terms, you could say that Strom believed his movement wasn't about race and that it was about standing up for the South, trying to show that we had just as much potential as any other region of the country with our flaws and all. And eventually, Essie May found the courage to tell her father that many black people didn't like him, which truly did have an effect on him, according to her. Essie stated that what many people saw as racism, Strom saw as paternalism, and that in his own way, he was standing up for the South and people of both races. Over halfway through his career, she noted that maybe he was looking in the mirror and saw George Wallace, and she stated that everything was relative with my father, like his diet, like the Cuban Missile Crisis, like the Kennedy Underworld Connections. History would prove that Strom Thurmond wasn't as crazy or fanatical as he might have sounded at the time. So Essie May, she went on to be a teacher and she maintained contact with Strom until he died. And she, Strom was there for her. She lost a husband in 1964 and he supported her all for the rest of, her, for the rest of his life and the grandkids. He met his grandkids through her um, and he kept supporting them. And he never insisted that she had to keep quiet. He was never, he never made her sign anything or said, if you tell anyone about this, I'll cut you. Right? He didn't say anything like that. He just gave her money. Because I think in his heart, he really did love her. And I think he knew he did wrong. But um, like a true teacher, she maintained her interest in history. And she applied to join the United Daughters of the Confederacy before uh, she died. But she was died before she was able to be accepted. So it's a sad story, but I think it's a powerful one that we can all learn from. If someone like Essie May, who Strom probably hurt the most, could find it in her heart to accept Strom, then the least Americans could do is try to understand his story. But instead, the popular historians have made him a permanent scapegoat for America's race problems. There's a popular book by a historian named Joseph Crespino, and he said in the book Strom Thurmond's America, that the Dixiecrat presidential run wasn't well received because it was an imperfect rhetoric in 1948 and much was lost in trying to translate white supremacist rage into abstract conservative principle. And this is just one snarky example of the type of things historians say. But it wasn't abstract what he was saying. I mean, the guy who founded libertarianism said it was a very well-defined political statement and there's nowhere where you find the words white supremacist anywhere in what the Dixiecrat literature was saying or what their own speeches were saying. Crespino was right in that Strom was a flawed human being. But having flaws is part of this human experience, and there's good and bad you can take from any situation. For example, if you look at Strom Thurmond's 1957 filibuster, okay, he stood there for, only tw for over 24 hours. This man stood up for a whole day reading election statutes in alphabetical order, reading the founding documents. He got through the filibuster by snacking on cold steak and pumpernickel bread, drinking orange juice, popping malted milk tablets, and sucking on throat lozenges. The entire speech filled 96 pages and had an estimated printing cost of $7,776. It was an immense waste of time and money, and this guy spent a lot of time trying to repair his image from that. But it showed people that Strom Thurmond was a guy willing to stand up for what he believed in and what his supporters believed in, even if it was wrong or unpopular. 
Look at the head of the South Carolina NAACP later on, whose name was Isaac Williams. He wrote that we don't care what the senator did in the 40s and 50s, but how he is representing us in 1978. Try to punish a politician for the sins of the past. What does it profit him to improve? And then even Joe Biden, who I've put in a picture up here, he's seeking nomination for the presidential election next year. And he actually has recounted going into the Senate to try to challenge people like Thurman, but then he realized, wow, this guy wasn't anything like I thought he was. That's his words. And he's been on videos dedicating uh, you know, Strom Thurmond's career where he said, Strom Thurmond is just a guy that gets things done. Joe Biden said that, okay? So my argument is that there's a lot of ways we could try to interpret Strom. Maybe the point is that Southerners need to stop letting cultural imperialists and modern carpetbaggers dictate what we can think and feel about our own history. A huge reason Strom said the things that he did and caused all the controversy was because he was just trying to stand up for the South. Maybe the South needs to accept the fact that we're just different and we need to stop worrying about uneducated people crying racism every day. Or maybe Strom really was just a bad person and the only reason we should remember him is because, you know, hey, it could happen again, right? That's what a lot of people say. But whether you love Strom Thurmond or hate him, nobody can deny he had a powerful energy. I mean, you don't live to be 100 years old unless the good Lord is willing to let you live that long. And he had an unmatched devotion to the state. And I think if we could take his stubbornness and his longevity and apply it to modern day in a positive, uplifting way, the Southern tradition could really make a difference. So I really appreciate your time.